Well, Dr. Sadler, we hope that you provide us some clarity about your research, the process of it, and we thank you for coming to talk with us today about it. So please, welcome Dr. Sadler today. Thanks. So I'm, I'm actually very excited to uh, talk in uh, National Library Week about this because the story of my book is in some part a story of uh, a library and what happened in that library for me and, and the sort of research that, that took place. Um, so a little bit of history about these debates. This, is, this presentation, I'm not going to be trying to go you know, very deep into that. They start in about 1931, and they uh, take place originally starting in Paris uh, with the Société Française de Philosophie. There's a session which is specifically on the issue of Christian philosophy. Is there, is there such a thing? Is it possible? If, if there is such a thing, what would its nature be? How would we know how to distinguish it from non-Christian philosophy? And the, some of the very important intellectuals at that time get invited to this. This is sort of the who's who of, of philosophy in uh, 1930s France. And they hash the issues out. And these are people who actually knew each other for a long time. Some of them had studied with each other and um, had written in response to each other. So it's not something completely new. It's not as if somebody just threw it on the table and said, Christian philosophy, what about that? And then people lined up. There were already some, some lines drawn about this. Um, the battle lines actually start getting drawn, and interestingly, the, the first battle lines are between secularists, what we would nowadays call secularist philosophers, but they were called rationalists at that time, and um, various Christian philosophers, most, uh, most of whom were, were Catholic. There were some French Reformed Protestant philosophers who got involved in the debate as well. But then very quickly, the Catholic philosophers start having an intra-Catholic debate with each other. Some of them actually are against the notion of Christian philosophy. They say philosophy and theology have to be kept completely distinct. Others say, well, no, there is such a thing, and you can find it in history. Others say, well, it would be a project yet to be worked out. And so they're arguing with each other, sometimes understanding each other well, sometimes not you know, uh, grasping what each other are, are after. And they engage each other through literary means. Part of it is face-to-face -face through, is it working? Part of it is face-to-face -face through um, conferences. There's three main conferences in which this takes place. The Société Française de Philosophie in 1931, and then in 1932, the Société d'Études Philosophiques um, meets, and they discuss the issue. And then I've actually brought some, uh, some props, you might say. Um, in 1933, the Société Thomiste, the, the Thomistic philosophers, they decide to make their second day of study devoted to the problem of Christian philosophy. And they, they bring together people who are for it and people who are against it, and they hash it out in those debates. Um, and I've, I've, got, I've run along a number of different uh, texts that you can, you can take a look at if, if you want. Um, I, I hardly need to say any of this to you because many of you are librarians. They have to be handled with some care because they're, they're very old. Um, and you notice that I've, I've given them quite a beating myself as I've read through them. Interestingly, I think all of you know this, French books um, that were written and published back then, they all more or less look the same, don't they? They all have the same kind of uh, look to them, and they're well constructed. They hold together pretty, pretty well, don't they, compared to some, some uh, English and American ones. Okay, so that was a digression. Um, they start writing articles in a number of different journals. Um, some of these are major philosophical journals, some of them are, are devoted to church history, some of them are devoted to history itself, some of them are devoted to theology. They write some books. Um, Etienne Gilson comes along, and the year after that, he does the Gifford Lectures, and he publishes these. They've been translated as the Spirit of Medieval Philosophy. Um, Maurice Blondel publishes uh, Le Problème de la Philosophie Catholique. Jacques Moritain publishes a book, which I believe we have in the library here, an essay on Christian philosophy. And a number of people are, are engaged in this. And they're all writing in response to each other. They're not just going off on their own. They are interlocutors in a vast debate. So about 50 or so authors get involved, some of them more than others, by about 1936. And, and by 1936, the debates are pretty much over. 
you start seeing articles where they're summarizing the debates and rather than trying to make any new contributions. So that's a sign that we're, we're pretty much done. Uh, would it have continued on? Perhaps, but all of you know, you know what's taking place in history at this time, the build-up to World War II. So they're becoming very preoccupied with other issues, and the major philosophers are, are moving on to, to different issues. Um, I call this a rogues gallery or, or a who's who, you know, depending on, on which side you, you fit in on this. And I just want to talk about a few of the, the major uh, figures who are involved. Um, Etienne Gilson, um, whose archives are at the University of Toronto, um, he was a major player. He was actually one of the people who was invited to speak at that very first Société Française de, de Philosophie meeting. That was his presentation that, in effect, gets the ball rolling. Uh, his good friend Jacques Maritain, uh, another French Thomist philosopher. Etienne Gilson was a, a major historian of philosophy. He was one of the guys who sort of brought medieval philosophy back into the French philosophical uh, educational establishment. Because until then, they, they had the sort of enlightenment ideal that, well, the Middle Ages, they were just dark ages. There was nothing worthwhile to study, nothing to look at. And Gilson was one of the people who pioneered that. He wasn't the first person to actually teach medieval philosophy in France. He sometimes gets, gets credited for that, but he actually wasn't the first. It was another guy who was involved in these debates. Uh, Moritin, his, um, his archives are actually at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. Um, another major Catholic philosopher, uh, contributes a lot to our understanding of the debates. Again, he and Gilson saw eye to eye on these things. They, can, they constituted the core of one major side. Uh, Maurice Blondel, I found a nice painting of him online. This is probably about what he looked like at the time of the debates. He was somewhat older than Gilson and Moritain. They were in a different generation. Interestingly, he had studied with some of the same people, and he had some of the same life path. He was another major uh, Catholic philosopher whose uh, book, Action, um, has been translated by Oliva Blanchet, who recently actually uh, just brought out another book on Blondel, an excellent book uh, that I would recommend for anybody studying these things. This was uh, very revolutionary stuff. This, this transformed um, philosophical discourse. And, and as um, Ms. Whitfield was saying, some of this actually believe it or not, led to the Second Vatican Council. Maurice Blondel's thought, through several different strains, leads to, to that very important event in 20th century theology and philosophy. So Blondel articulates a whole new position. Leon Brunschweig, who kind of looks a bit like Blondel in this one, doesn't he? Um, Leon Brunschweig was on the other side. He was against Christian philosophy. He was what we would call today a secularist, uh, when you hear people like you know Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens, these people who are very big in the, the, the media right now and create a big splash, he was one of those of the day. Um, and so he was arguing against the possibility of Christian philosophy. Um, he was helped out by the very young Emile Brehier, uh, who had, had recently made a big splash by uh, giving some conferences where he argued there was no such thing as Christian philosophy, Anything that could even remotely look like that was not real philosophy. Um, because it wasn't real thought. It was constrained by, by religious dogma. We don't have a picture of him, interestingly. I, when I went online to try to find pictures of these guys, you can't find a picture of Emile Brehier anywhere. I'm not quite sure why, but that's the case. So I put up a picture of one of his books. Um, Gabriel Marcel a French existentialist philosopher and phenomenologist. He was uh, one of the people who argued for the possibility of Christian philosophy. He articulated yet another position. Uh, Léon Noël was a good example of a neo-Thomist who argued against the possibility of Christian philosophy. I tried to find somebody else who was <clears throat> even more important in that, Fernand von Steinbergen, uh, but I couldn't find a picture of him either nor can I find a picture of quite a few of these guys. Finally, finally um, Henri de Lubac, one of the important theologians of the 20th century, who's uh, influenced a lot of uh, uh, thinkers both in, in uh, Catholic Church and in Protestant churches, um, he is the guy who in some respects brings the debates to a close. 
he writes an article in 1936 called On Christian Philosophy. And in it, he summarizes everybody's views and he brings them together and he says, well, you know, this, this view is compatible with this. And, uh, but, but if you read through his article, it's effectively bringing the, the, the end to it. It's, it's closing the book. It's closing the, uh, the chapter. So those, those are some of the main people involved. Um, a little bit of intellectual history, some cultural background, which explains why um, people might actually be interested in, in this book today. We are in a situation, as far as the life of the mind goes, that is somewhat similar to that of France in the uh, early 20th century. Um, so these debates are actually more timely now than they were for uh, American you know, philosophers and historians and, and theologians and, and even ordinary, uh, you know, interested, uh, ed educated, literate people. They're more relevant today than they were perhaps back then. The French Third Republic was very secular. Um, as a matter of fact, they, they were um, so anti-Catholic, so... Uh, obsessed with the notion of separating church and state, that Maurice Blondel, when he uh, attained his, um, his license to teach, was not allowed to teach for two years. Everything was centralized in, in Paris. And the guy who was in charge said, well, you brought in religion into your philosophy. I can't allow you in the classroom. Um, now, this was in a university. This wasn't just teaching high school or something like that where, you know, it might be impressionable young minds. This was in the university where it's supposed to be open. All sides are supposed to be represented. It gives you an idea of what was going on at that time. Um, philosophy, why was philosophy important? Well, philosophy was viewed as being sort of the, the king of the disciplines. It was the discipline which brought together the other ones. It was uh, the discipline where um, you would deal with objects unconstrained by a single emphasis on, say, biology or psychology, you were trying to bring things together in a comprehensive view, um, which, which has its you know, downside sometimes as well. Right? Sometimes it can get a little abstract. But philosophy was viewed as one of the central disciplines for the development of modern thought. And there was a great danger with that of philosophy sort of losing sight of its essence. And that is actually what has happened in large part in, in American philosophy. If, if you know anything about um, what happened in the 20th century to American philosophy, we used to at one time have our own philosophical tradition. And it was in communication with literature and the sciences and religion. And it was very broad and it, it engaged a lot of things. It was sort of like the philosophy that we're talking about here. Um, analytic philosophy, which does have its, you know, its good points, but analytic philosophy came and with its, its very narrow emphasis on you know, very specific problems and not looking at history, not reading texts, just only looking at isolated passages and arguments, it displaced um, our, our classical tradition, which was engaged with, with these French thinkers. William James and, and Blondel actually knew each other. Um, so did William James and Bergson, and, and these thinkers communicated back and forth. They were in danger of the same thing happening in France. When philosophy tries to purify itself and become very, you know, uh, methodologically astute, usually the result is it, it quits being philosophy. You know, it's one of those sort of things where the, the more you try to fix it and, 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 you know, just clean it up and we're only going to do this, the less philosophical you are. And so there was a great danger, and this is being pointed out during the debates. Um, at the same time, this is very interesting, religious thought was undergoing a renaissance in France, and it had been since about the 1860s. Previously to that, or prior to that, sorry, um, if you had looked at, say, French, Catholic, and even, even Protestant thought, say, in 1830 or, or 1800, it was pretty moribund. It was, it was pretty dull, kind of clueless stuff. You know, a lot of preaching to the choir, not a lot of engagement of, of, of other perspectives, um, not a lot of what you could call first-class thinkers. In the early part of the 20th century, there's this massive awakening that takes place. And it, and it, may, take, it may take place in part because of the pressure exerted on them from the secular establishment. You know, when, when you have to undergo... Uh, Diversity like that, sometimes 
Uh, that brings out the best, doesn't it? When you have to engage your interlocutors, when you can't just sort of sit back on your laurels. Um, but there were a lot of things going on. And so you had some first class, serious, you know, uh, contenders for being, you know, the major philosophers out there. And they were, they were religious. So you could actually have a debate then about Christian philosophy. Because you had people out there not just talking about it, but, but perhaps even modeling it. Um, also what was going on too is people were doing better history. Again, like I pointed out, there was this perception for a long time that the Middle Ages were just dark ages. And if you don't read medieval thinkers, that's really easy to, uh, to, to agree with, isn't it? And that is still what we teach in some of our, our high school and even some of our college um, history classes. In my critical thinking classes, sometimes I will bring up with my students, in the Middle Ages, did everyone think the world was, was round or, or flat? And they all say flat. Well, if you actually read somebody like uh, Anselm of Canterbury, in one of his books, he says, he just mentions this offhand. Well, as we all know, the world is round. He's writing to educated people of his time. And this is not in the high Middle Ages. This is actually before, around the time of the Norman Conquest. But educated people at that time knew that. So why don't we, from the, from the uh, vantage point to the present, know that quite often? Well, because people have done poor history. They've done ideologically based history. So what was going on with this were uh, people like Gilson were, in fact, um, doing better and better history. And he and Brettier actually clashed about the, the historical connections there. So that made it into a live issue. Um, why was it, you know, philosophy and Christianity? Well, you can, one really quick answer to that is that France was, you know, not a Buddhist nation. It was not a uh, Hindu nation. It was a, a Christian nation, at least, you know, in the, the, the demographically. But there were some historical issues. I mean, if you look at the history of philosophy, there were Christian philosophers. So is the sort of thing that they were doing, is that still philosophy if they allowed their, their Christian faith to become very important. Is Thomas Aquinas a philosopher, or is he just a theologian? Is Anselm of Canterbury, you know, comes up with the so-called ontological argument. Is, it, is that just theology, or is that philosophy? I mean, we teach it in intro to philosophy class, but maybe we shouldn't be if that's not the case. Um, philosophy takes on different emphases in, in different times. In the Middle Ages, it, it took on, you know, a lot of issues about the nature of God, or the way society ought to be. Um, there's some other interesting things going on. The modern era is not just a time of secularization. It's a time when people are pushing secularization, when they're saying, this is a good thing. We ought to be getting rid of religion. Religion is just, you know, irrational. We need to push it off the scene. Um, and we need to push off the modes of thought that we're focusing on that. So if you have that sort of viewpoint, then you get rid of Thomas Aquinas. You get rid of Blaise Pascal. Um, you get rid of Maurice Blondel, too. Um, philosophy and religion are bound to come into some sort of contact with each other, too, because think about it. When a person has a philosophy, what do we mean by that? It means that they have some sort of overarching, you know, tie everything together, view from, uh, you know, a sort of synthetic perspective of everything. If they really have a philosophy, that's what it means. Um, what is it if somebody really has religious faith? Something like that, too, isn't it? If somebody really is committed, then it pervades the entirety of their life. Now, if they happen to be somebody who's living the life of the mind, their religious faith will somewhat pervade that, won't it? Inevitably. So the question is, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Does that mean that they can't really be a historian, a uh, philosopher, a Psychologist, does that interfere with it, or does it actually, in some respects, make it better? That's that's a live issue that these um, people were debating about. By 1930, uh, a lot of people have been using this term Christian philosophy, but nobody had actually defined it. So, what happens when people use terms uh, in a lot of different ways with a lot of different meanings? Pretty soon, somebody starts saying. Hey, we better figure out what we actually mean by this. Do you mean this, or this, or this? And that's part of what they were trying to do in these uh, debates. Now, that's all background. 
Now I'd like to tell you a little bit of the story. This is where we, we get to the library matters. I'd like to tell you a little bit of the story of how I got involved in this. And so it becomes a little bit more um, idiosyncratic, a little bit more narrative at this point. Because um, I'm not a big philosopher. I'm, I'm just somebody who, who likes this stuff. So I went to graduate school, like, like you know most philosophy profs do, and um, I actually did my dissertation on Maurice Blondel. I never published it because it, it, it wasn't, in my view, uh, anything that could be published. And it really needs to be broken down into several different works. I, you know, I did some interesting things, but it was kind of incoherent. And then, like a lot of people, what I did is I put it aside. You know, after you finish, those of you who have you know, done master's theses or dissertations, what's the, the first thing you want to do after you get done with it? Something else. <laughs> put it aside and don't think about it. But I did still really like Maurice Blondel. And a colleague of mine... Uh, Adrian Paps, who I'd run, at, I'd run into at a conference, he was actually studying in, in Paris, and he sent me those, these photocopied documents. And he said, you know, you like translating. Why don't you translate Maurice Blondel? Translate some of this stuff. And those were a few documents from these debates. And I didn't know about these debates before that. And actually, I let those sit for about six months before I, I picked them up. Then when I did, and I started reading through them, I started saying, there's really something here. There's, there's some, some really interesting discussions. And this isn't just Maurice Blondel. This is Etienne Jolson and Jacques Morantin and Brett Yer, and They all have these different sides. What's going on here? So I started digging a little bit. And like I put here, as I started researching, um, what I found out two things. One was the English-speaking literature on this, on these debates, they called it a debate. They didn't call it debates. And they saw it as just between you know one or two people, or not one or two, uh, two or three people, just a few sides, either Etienne Jolson versus uh, Emile Brehier, and then Blondel had written a little bit about it, or um, Etienne Jolson versus uh, von Steinbergen. And the reason that that was the case is because Jolson's stuff was translated. Um, Blondel's stuff wasn't. Most of the other people's stuff wasn't. So what do you know? English speaking, English reading researchers often do, they stick to the stuff that's available in, in, in English. And there's a vicious cycle. If you don't read the foreign languages, you have no idea about what's going on in these other texts, and then you, you know, have no interest in seeing them translated. And it keeps reinforcing itself. So I decided I wanted to break this, this cycle. And as I did it, and I found more and more texts, and this, this took place over a period of about three years, this bigger and bigger and bigger picture kept emerging. And I started seeing more and more sides and more and more discussions. And I started finding out that even the bibliographies of the debates were not complete. That um, there were sources, there were discussions that were not in the bibliographies. And I had to track them down. Um, so I have a metaphor for this. It's sort of like going from, imagine you're, you're in a concert hall. And there's two or three singers up there, and they're singing back and forth to each other. And then more voices come in, and more voices come in. And it's all very well orchestrated. Um, eventually, it's an entire chorus. And some of them are singing you know, this, this line, and some are singing this line, and it's all going back and forth. So you're going from just a few voices singing a couple melodies to this gigantic, very involved, not always harmonious, because uh, it was debate. You know, it was they were debates, uh, but it was this gigantic chorus. Um, now, the work of translation itself, I enjoy translating, and I had done it before. Um, I translated a few things from French uh, when I was in graduate school, and I've been a member of the Aquinas Translation Project, translating some of Aquinas's Latin works, mostly his commentary on the Psalms. Um, back when I was in graduate school. Continue doing that. So this seemed to be something I could I could sink my teeth into and something I would like to do. Um, but this was very different. Um, when I translated before, it was it was single things or it was part of a larger work by one author. With this, I was actually deciding to translate um, many works by many different authors. The uh, what I've got in here is in large part Maurice Blondel, but also Etienne Josson, Jacques, uh, um, not Jacques Martin, his, his part isn't in there, um, 
Gabriel Marcel, all the people who were talking with Blondell, Fernand von Steinbergen, and all these people have different voices. You know, we don't write the same. And it was very exciting to try to replicate their different tonalities and to see how their thoughts played off against each other. Um, and the work of translation, if any of you do it, you know it's very different than, say, writing your own work. You're giving voice to another person. And it's very liberating in a way. You don't have to come up with anything original, which is kind of nice for an academic. You don't have to try to do original history of philosophy or ideas. You just have to help somebody else speak in a different language, your own language. Um, and so that is what I did. I, I, uh, I got into it and I found myself enjoying it. I would go down to my basement office day after day after day and translate and then go back over the translations. And I started writing about it and, and publishing some articles about it and talking about it. And then what I was doing at the same time, I call this uh, haunting and prospecting the stats. And this is where we get to something we were discussing before uh, the presentation, why it's so important to have access to libraries. Um, what I would do is I would actually go and, and I would dig through entire, entire journal collections. And um, I couldn't have done that if they weren't available, if they weren't in the stacks. And, and they weren't available in a lot of libraries. Um, I found this out when I had to uh, get the book, you know, go through the entire process of publishing. Catholic University of America Press said, send us the originals that you're translating from. I said, well, I'm sure you have them. You're in Washington, D.C. You're at Catholic, Catholic University of America. And they went in their library and they didn't have them. And these were very important French journals. These weren't, you know, some obscure thing. They, they just didn't have them. A lot of research libraries are not as well stocked as some of the ones that I was fortunate enough to maybe spoil into thinking we're, we're the, the norm. Um, and I would just go and, and you know, spend sometimes a, a Saturday afternoon where I would get off of work teaching and then I would drive to the library and I would wait, you know, until 9 at night, 10 at night and just go through this set of journals or these, these books. Did a lot of digging around. And like I put here, it's kind of an academic, an academic form of play. It was very enjoyable. It was like uh, doing something, a cross between a scavenger hunt and traipsing around in the woods. Um, and that was possible only because those stacks were open and because um, things were well organized and you could find what you were looking for. Um, so the work of libraries is very, you know, very vital. Where did I do all this? At Notre Dame University. I, I lived about an hour and a half away. And so I would drive out there. Um, it was not that far from the, the prison where I was working at the time. What would I do? I would scour the stacks. And sometimes I would find only one new article. Sometimes I wouldn't even find any. Um, sometimes I would hit the mother load and find you know, a book I hadn't known about or uh, five articles. And I would photocopy all of them. And I actually have a file cabinet filled with these, these photocopies. Uh, there were several parts of Notre Dame Hesper Library, and I've got some nice shots of it here, because uh, I have a very strong attachment to that place. There were several places that were, or, or, or organizations that were particularly instrumental, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. Notre Dame has a medieval institute, and so a lot of the, the people who were doing work on this issue were medievalists. So I would go there and I would dig through their materials. Um, they also have the Jacques Moritan Center. And um, I found some of my sources there, and I also found a lot of hospitality from the people who run the Jacques Mortin Center because he was one of the people involved in these debates, and they were, they were very helpful uh, with me. And then uh, I, I was lucky enough to get a summer fellowship to not to study Christian philosophy or the debates, but actually to study um, practical rationality with Alistair McIntyre in this, this Erasmus Institute faculty fellowship. Well, they put us up at Notre Dame. And they, you know, they fed us. And it was really great food, of course, too. Um, so what did I do every night? After we got done with our fellowship stuff, I was in the library for about four hours. And it was, you know, this wasn't something that you could do um, once and get it over with. It's not get on EBSCO and download, you know, a few articles. This is the sort of thing that research requires. And research, you know, when, when people say, why do you actually need a library? Why do you need all these physical stats? 
because you actually don't know until you get in there how much work you're going to have to do. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know if anybody uh, who makes those sort of decisions will see this, but I would love for them to hear about this sort of thing and how important it is just to have resources in place for those who, who want to use them. Um, here's a few other images from, from Notre Dame. Yeah, here's the stacks. Um, these are actually the, the basement ones where some of the, the uh, popular journals were, were kept. And I had to go through the popular journals as well because this was a, an issue that people were talking about. So people would write about it in some of the French newspapers. Um, this is uh, uh, an interesting image. Does anyone know what, what, what this one is? There, there's kind of a story about the Notre Dame Heshford Library. I always thought it was a touchdown. It is. And you can see it from the Notre Dame Coliseum. It's, it's, you know, I don't think they originally meant it to be uh, Jesus giving the touchdown thing. It's this vast mosaic, and it's a, the signature piece, you know, and there's the apostles and, and the kings and all, all these other people. But, yeah, it, you, apparently if you get in the stadium, you can see Jesus giving the touchdown sign. So... Um, now, what, what's in the book? What, what do readers get from it? This is actually the, the very beginning of my book tour, so um, I have to give you a, kind of a pitch, right? Um, there's translations of a lot of documents, and some of these are from key moments in the debates. I translated Jill Sohn's um, uh, piece at the Société Française de Philosophie because that is one of the central pieces hadn't been translated. Um, we got the permission from the Gilson archives, and, and uh, it's in there. Uh, Maurice Blondel's works, uh, his, his voice had been allowed to go silent because, um, again, nobody had translated it, so everyone assumed it wasn't important, there wasn't anything going on there, nobody looked at it, and then, of course, nobody translated it. And I, I wanted to break that cycle. Representative pictures of main positions. I, I've got some of the some of the Catholic Thomists who were actually against Christian philosophy represented in there as well. Um, I've got some of the, the rationalists who were against Christian philosophy. Um, and then important commentary. There were there were some people whose commentary kind of defined the debate. They weren't you know key players themselves, but they provided some really good sum up of what was going on. Um, and and that's kind of a contribution. Sometimes just being able to give a, a good overview is, is, kind of, is a contribution. And then, uh, so that's actually not my own writing, other than, you know, I translate it. That's everybody else's writing, and that's the bulk of the book. So, in a larger respect, I'm not really the author. I'm, I, it lists me as the, the translator and editor. Um, I am the author of one thing, the introduction. And there's about a hundred page introduction. Part of it is historical, giving you, you know, the background and what was going on. And then part of it is thematic. I do some studies of the particular philosophers. Uh, and then there's something that's been missing for a while, a chronological bibliography. It's not just a bibliography, which is, would be useful by itself, just to have a more or less comprehensive one, but a chronological one that lets you see date by date how the debates are developing. Um, you know, it'd be really cool would be to have some sort of online interactive one where you could index it on a figure or a keyword or something like that. But we don't, we don't have anything like that yet. Um, I wanted to give kind of a pictorial representation of, you know, what did we actually get done with this? Because, um, you know, I'm not writing in a vacuum. Some of this stuff is already out, and if you wanted to study these debates, you know, for example, um, Jill Sohn's uh, Spirit of Medieval Philosophy, major work in these debates. Um, it's been around for a long time. Thank, you know, thank goodness. Um, here's what I've done, and I didn't put all the little things in. My book includes um, parts of the Société Française de Philosophie session, Josson Blondel's contributions, the entirety of the Société d'Etudes Philosophique session where uh, Blondel and um, six other philosophers talked about, about this and debated it back and forth, and a bunch of smaller pieces. Um, what's available in English right now, besides what I've given? Gilson's Spirit of Medieval Philosophy, another book by him, Philosophy and Christianity, where he actually, this was very interesting, he expanded the discussions to include Protestant philosophers. So he's a Catholic philosopher engaging Protestant philosophers. Uh, Maritain's essay on Christian philosophy is available. And Brehier's History of Philosophy uh, is available. What's not translated? 
Well, Blondell's the problem de la philosophie catholique is not translated yet. You notice this is a pretty substantive work. So there's still more, more work to be done in, in, in these debates. The uh, Société Thomiste 1933 session hasn't been translated either. Um, that may be something that we need to do as well. What is good news, the Lubox article was translated a while ago. So a good summary of it that brings it to a close has been translated. Um, I have a few future projects, and I'm, I'm a little bit short on time, so I'm going to skim through this very quickly. I have, I have two book projects that I, I'm going to start on after this summer that I already have some work done on a little bit. Um, one is to write an actual history of the debates, an intellectual history, something that hasn't been done yet. Some people have written a bit about it, but nobody's actually done the history of, of ideas work yet. Um, I want to do some additional translations. Again, that, that involves getting permissions. Uh, I, have to, I have to actually get permission from the, uh, Arch, the Center d'Archive de Maurice Blondel in order to translate this, but I think this should be the next thing translated. And there's actually a Maurice Blondel translation project which is forming right now, um, which may in fact tackle that. So I might, be, I might not have to do it myself. I might be able to push it off on other people, right? Wouldn't that be nice? Um, I am putting together additional videos. You notice I'm, I'm, I'm recording right now. Um, I'm putting together additional videos that deal not just with my book, but with the issues and the figures and, and the debates themselves. Uh, I'll upload them to, to YouTube, right? You're in this great web 2.0 environment to work in. And actually, I'm going to be putting together an interactive website. Um, I'm not going to actually release it until it looks very good, but I've started working on that. Uh, a website devoted to this issue and to the debates. But it will go beyond the debates and also engage not just Catholic thinkers, but, but the Protestant thinkers who've talked about this. Um, I have a few website things, and I'll be happy to give these to anybody who, who wants them. Uh, you can get my book. Actually, I, I'm going to be selling copies here if anyone wants uh, to buy one, and I'll write something nice in it for you. Um, or you can get it from uh, these, these various locations. If you're really interested in this and you want something in English that gives you an overview of it, my um, Internet Encyclopedia Philosophy entry goes through these debates and narrates them. It's not quite as long as, as the introduction to the book, but it's pretty extensive. And then if you want to see uh, videos or um, you know, read about the book, or actually I'm going to be doing some podcasts and reading from the book eventually, um, my blog has some spots, my, my website has it, and I have a YouTube channel as well. Um, I'm finding it's, 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 you know, it's a great way to get other people uh, interested in this and, and you know, disseminate the word, this, this Web 2.0 environment. Um, I was going to do some readings, but I think instead what I'd, what I'd rather do is um, just take questions, because it's already uh, 118, and I know people have places to go, so... Um, you can take questions, or you guys can take a look at these if you want to as well. Should I pass these around? These, these French books? Uh, but yeah, does anybody have any uh, questions? Or? I have yeah. a question. You said that the Third Republic was very secular. Yes, secularist. But as European governments do, they were playing musical chairs about every two or three years. So was any of this debate creeping into the political debate? No. Um, the political debate largely turned on, you know, right versus left things, you know, like the, the workers versus, um, uh, you know, the bourgeoisie or, you know, um, what to do about the rising power of Germany, all those sorts of things. And, and what I'm saying is that the, the secularist setting, it really wasn't political so much as it was part of the, the institutional culture. I mean, governments would change, right? But those bureaucrats in charge don't. The entire social um, system and uh, the, uh, the people in charge of the departments, they stay the same. Uh, similar to our case, you know, we... Uh, we change our presidents and, and representatives and people like that every so often, but 
if once you're in the State Department and you're part of the hierarchy, you're in it. Once you're in the Department of Education, the top person may change, but almost all the other people are going to stay in place. And it's very hard to, to alter institutional culture. And the institutional culture was decidedly secular. As a matter of fact, one of the things that the, the Catholics started doing in the educational uh, realm was to establish their own um, universities, Institut Catholique. Um, and there's one in Paris, there's, there's one in, in uh, Marseille by that time, I think. Um, they're spread around. There's more now than there, there were back then. Uh, but like I said, you know, Blondel, a great example of this. Blondel writes uh, this book, Action. He doesn't actually um, start from religion. He argues towards religion, going through philosophy. And that's enough to keep him from being able to teach. And when he actually does get to teach, they put him out in the provinces. He can't teach in Paris. He has to teach way out in the, the boonies. So. Um. Go ahead. How long would you say it took you to do your, your research on this? Well, that's a good question. Um, if we mean like the whole process from when I first read the material that Adrian sent me to publication, we're talking about, I would say, eight years. Wow. Um, but I would say that the majority of the research in the stacks that was over about a three to four year period. And I was going out there probably at least once or twice a month. Um, and some of the time I wasn't very productive. You know, I was just kind of looking around. But that, that sort of um, leisure, I think, is very important for research. And again, you know, it's not possible to do that unless you have access to, to the library. We were talking just earlier about cutting hours and, you know, the graduate students not having as much access. They're the ones who need it the most. Um, and, and so much of, of real research is not just having a, a narrowly focused problem that you're going to solve and then you're going to get to, but reading around, you know. And, and I would go, I would often be surprised. I would go into a set of stacks because I was going to look uh, up this one bibliographical reference and then this is what happens in stacks. You all know this. You're walking along and you, and you see something that catches your eye. And you're like, oh, what's that? I, I'm going to take this down. And then you start paging through. And sometimes there's nothing useful in there. And sometimes you, you have a revelation. Whoa, this guy actually wrote, a, wrote an article about Christian philosophy. This wasn't in any of the, the bibliographies. Oh, and he cites three more people, three more sources I can go check out. Um, Again, you can't do that unless you have open stacks. So, yeah. I actually feel bad for the people at, at universities, the really big universities where they don't have open stacks. Mm -hmm. You know, especially the European ones. I know, yeah. I, know I was late, but um, I apologize. But uh, Yeah, you missed the part where I told everybody everything about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get so proficient in French? And English. Oh, um, my family is in, in origin French Canadian, and I grew up with my mom speaking French to me and my uncles, you know, swearing in French and, <laughs> and, and people talking French around me. And I didn't, you know, I, I sort of absorbed that, but that's not actually learning French yet. And then I remember when I was a kid. My mom made me take a French class in middle school and a French class in high school. Like, like most kids uh, forced to do that sort of stuff, I, I screwed around and I, did, I, didn't, I didn't like it and I resisted it. But I did learn some things on the way. And then when I got into college, you know, and I could talk with my, my family, um, but I didn't, I didn't really have a very large vocabulary and I couldn't do literary French. Um, then when I got into college, they threw me into this French language house because they, they, they knew I, I spoke French and they wanted to get the program going. And then I kind of liked it. And I, and I um, we had, you know, some native speaker from Toulouse there, and she and I got to be friends, and we, we'd chat a lot. And then um, I just started reading. And the more that you read, you know, it's just like anything else. Um, 
the more that you read, the more vocabulary you pick up, um, the more you start to grasp the locutions, the less kind of silly mistakes that you make in translating because you start to grasp the larger picture. And by the time that I got to graduate school, I, I was um, um, pretty proficient in, in French. I'd gone to France and gone to Quebec and, and met some of my my family, and, and you know, I would, I would talk. And my, the French that I speak isn't very pretty to hear. It's not, it's not the French of Paris. It's kind of a mix of Canadian French and uh, and uh, French French, which is as different than you know Mexican Spanish is to Castilian Spanish. Um, but it came in very handy for for this sort of stuff. Um, and there are actually some French words that are very difficult to translate that that come in here, like. Uh, they had this, this word that they were all using at the time, integral, which you could translate as sort of complete and comprehensive, or sometimes I just use the, 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 the cognate integral. Um, none of those are actually captured adequately. But what are you going to do? You know, when you're translating, you've got to get it across somehow, and sometimes, the, like they say, you know, the best can be the enemy of the good. You go after the good that you can, you can get. So that's kind of a rambling answer. But. Oh, that's so good. Both that they have, um, I know that just like in whatever language there is, there's kind of like a vernacular that it's common oh. use, and then they have their scholarly Yeah. Did that make you kind of strong? Well, um, this is kind of an interesting point. The French that they were writing, the sort of educated, academic, scholarly French that they were writing is very classical. It's, um, it's uh, not at all like, the, like the, the, the French of today. Not the people's French, but the, the scholar's French. I don't like translating um, things written after about 1960 because I think French style has just gone down downhill. Because they, 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 they've got all these sort of affected things, and they were really getting away from that at that time. Um, they, uh, nowadays, everybody has to show how clever they are by making plays on words and very punchy sentences. These guys wanted; th these guys took people like St. Augustine or Cicero, people like that as their models, and they wanted to write coherent paragraphs in which the thoughts were clear. And the French language is actually very good for that, if you use it for that. You can also use it to be a, you know, totally obscure, which is what happens far too often these days, um, unfortunately. So, yeah. I'm so interested when you were talking about the library in terms of being to say for Walt to down and scan the shelves and yeah. some things. Did they have any of those materials digitized where you could search it differently or is Ah um, very little of it. I would suspect that more of it is available. And I know that at the time that I was beginning work, the French National Library had begun digitizing some of their, their journals. And I was able to get a very few articles that I, I needed from, from them. I think their, their goal was to digitize everything. So, you know, for instance, the Revue de Metaphysique and Moral, uh, I'm willing to bet that's available electronically now all over the place. Um, I can tell you one thing uh, that I just thought of. It's not only important to have open stacks, it's also very important to have copy machines all over the place <laughs> so that there's enough of them available uh, so you don't have to wait behind somebody else if you're going to do this kind of research, because I, I did it through photocopies. But there is something to actually holding the, the, the written page in your hand, too, and being able to page through a, a, a book. I kind of like that. Bound volumes, too, especially journals. You know, same same sort of thing as going through the stacks and seeing something at random that catches your eye. You go and you look up, um, you know, 1934, the August edition of, of this. But then you're, you're putzing around and you find out that there was something in December that, that ties in with that as well. So there's there's a, a value to having, you know, the best of both worlds would be we have everything digitized and we have the... So it's... it's a, you had to both... Both of them. If I had to choose? So you had the best of both worlds. Yeah. Digitized and on the shelf. You 
you were starting this again, how would you do it? Would you oh, go wow. to the shelves or would you just look at the digital versions? That's a good question. Um, I've never thought of that. I've never actually thought of how I would start this again if I were to. Because, you know, I, like, like so many other research projects, I started off with doing one thing and then it expanded. And there were, I think there were a lot of mistakes I made along the way in, in, in tracking things down. Um, I think it would probably be helpful to have digitized things to start with, but then there's there's still no substitute for getting out there and pounding the the linoleum and uh, digging through through the, the stacks and holding books in your hand and paging your way through them. Um, you know, it, it, it could be that what we, what we need are some local a certain amount of local research libraries where we could we could do that sort of thing with scholars because uh, they're not available everywhere. And I don't I don't actually know how much of how much of this is still available at the Notre Dame Library. I haven't been back there for several years. They might have gotten rid of some of them. Um, how what I know she had these works by Bondell and Usain. Uh, what tell me about how you track them down, and what was it easy or was it hard? Well, um, Gilson was pretty easy. Okay. Londell, as it turned out, some of the stuff is pretty pretty simple, like that. Um, the uh, the Pope Lemon of the Philosophy Catholic, I ordered that off of eight books, you know. Um, and a lot of Londell stuff was available in bibliographies. I did find, again, going through things like looking through the International Congresses of Philosophy. They have all the um, accounts. Blondell actually had some some discussions about Christian philosophy in different places that nobody had put in, into any bibliographies, um, and I found them by happenstance. Um, so I, that would be something very difficult, right? I mean, that was sort of needle and haystack type of stuff. There may be some other things out there that he actually wrote about Christian philosophy that I didn't find because one of the things with Blondell is he he not only wrote under his name, he wrote pseudonym- pseudonymously. Uh, one of the things that he would do sometimes to, to boost his side, he would bring out a work, and then he would do a review of that work under somebody else's name and bring out some aspects of his thought that he thought had not been sufficiently emphasized in it. It wasn't like he was just fluffing. You know, he wasn't just saying, oh, this is the best thing in the world, you got to buy it, or anything like that. He was, he was using that as a, a means to... Uh, a, a, address people who are attacking him uh, without actually bringing himself in for, for the full frontal fire, you know, if, if he was out there. He's kind of clever that way. Um, yeah. And he, he'd been doing that since, since he published um, Action in, in 1893. That drew a lot of fire from, from different people. And he did the same thing. He published under a couple different names. Uh, and uh, defended his book. And it, it also sort of created the, the idea that, oh, there's a whole crowd of scholars out there supporting him. Could boost your, yeah, your kids. Yeah. yeah. I suppose, you know what the equivalent would be to, in today's thing? If you were, you create a website, and you're taking controversial positions, and then you create some other web personas, and you have all of them pile in and say, yeah, this is really good, this guy knows what he's talking about, don't fight with him, that sort of thing. I'll bet you people do that, too. They do. Yeah. I was wondering, how did you get the physical books, too, that you have? The, oh, you mean these that I'm... That you're passing around. Most of them I actually how bought. How hard was it? It was, it was very easy because of our web environment. You know, okay. I bought them through eight books, for the most part. Um, Matter of fact, well, all of them except for the Spirit of Medieval Philosophy and, and this this copy, which I bought through Amazon, and then um, thank you. Um, the copy of Axion that I have over here, this was actually given to me when I defended my dissertation uh, by my my chair. Uh, as, as a gift. No. Um, and then this book, uh, Christianism and a Philosophy, which, which is actually translated. Um, my mother bought this one for me at a bookstore in Milwaukee, a used bookstore, and I had recommended that store to her 
I was in graduate school down in Southern Illinois at the time. She went in and she called me and she said, there's these books, you know, by, by Gilles Sohn. Do you want them? I said, how much are they? And she said, you know, they're like 10 bucks a piece. And I said, that's kind of pricey. Nah, I'll leave them there. But she bought it anyway. And, and uh, <laughs> So I'm, I'm very glad she did. Yeah. Uh, so I got them from uh, different places. Most of what I work from, though, is actually the, the photocopies of, uh, of uh, different articles. So, yeah. The books are fixed points, and then the articles are all the constellation around them. Thank you. Sure. Any other uh, questions? Well, thanks for your attention. I'm, uh, if you want to uh, purchase copies, I'm, I'm selling them um, over there. Um, I'd be happy actually to uh, sign the press release or anything like that if people want, want those sorts of things as well. So, but thanks for your attention, and uh, I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk about uh, this, this research and, and about the, the functional libraries. Thank you.